here we go. Hey, are you 18 to 30 living in the UK? Yeah? Well, listen up. Did you know that EU citizens can vote in the 2021 local elections? Due to COVID-19, last year's local elections in England, Scotland, and Wales were postponed to 2021 this year. Since last year's elections were still in the transition period for Brexit, EU citizens in the UK were eligible to vote. That means for this year's local elections on the 6th of May, 2021 in England, Scotland, and Wales, EU citizens are eligible to vote. Since the Brexit transition has officially completed as of December 2020, this may be the last chance for EU citizens based in the UK to vote in local elections in England. So what are you waiting for? Here at The Three Million, we're launching the Our Home, Our Vote campaign. We're encouraging young people, both UK and EU citizens alike, to register to vote in their local elections and make their voices heard. Local elections are on the 6th of May, but you need to register beforehand. The deadline to register is midnight on the 19th of April. Time is ticking, so don't wait, get registered. You can register online through our handy website. The website has additional resources explaining registration deadlines, how to register, and how to vote via post. Once registered, you can opt in for in-person or postal voting. More information on how to do this is on our website. Follow along to learn more, and if you're interested in joining the campaign, join us at the Young Europeans Network. This is our home and our vote. It's time to make our voices heard. So there we are. I hope that worked because I'm really bad at technology. But hey, if it's if you weren't able to see it, don't worry. It'll be on our YouTube. It'll be on our Twitter. It'll be everywhere. Um, so welcome to everybody um, and welcome to the Our Home, Our Vote launch. This is so exciting. Um, I wish we could have like confetti or something. That would be really fun. Um, but we'll do what we can. So um, first to introduce myself. I'm Antonia. Hello. I am currently running the campaign, the Our Home, Our home our vote campaign um, and I will be your host I guess for tonight and for this youth panel basically a little bit of a run of show we're just going to kind of introduce what the campaign is talk a little bit about it um, for the first 15 minutes or so just to kind of understand what this is about and then we're going to jump right into our youth panel with our fantastic speakers I'm so excited for you guys to meet them tonight they are all absolutely incredible and thank you so much for all our panelists here for joining because um you guys are great and I'm, I'm in awe um, currently, as you can tell. Um, so a brief little bit about what the campaign is basically is we are running a six month campaign from now until um, May Junish. Basically, what we're trying to do is encourage young people between the ages of 18 to 30 to first go out and register to vote and two to actually go and vote on the actual days. Um, registration de deadline for voting is um, midnight on the on April the 19th, so make sure you get registered by then. And local elections are on the 6th of May in England, um, Scotland and Wales. In Northern Ireland it's a little bit different, but we'll go into that um, in, in a later date. So basically what we're trying to do is, again, we're trying to encourage um, young people, both UK citizens and EU citizens alike, to go out and register and make their voices heard. The reason that we're focusing a little bit on EU citizens um, this year is because it might be the last chance for EU citizens to vote in England specifically because um, after Brexit, everything is just a little bit confused and, and we, we're kind of just wrapping our heads around it. So at, at the moment you can go and vote. So, you know, it's a, it's a good chance to try and get out there. So basically that's what we're doing. Um, and tonight is our launch. So we're going to be able to launch our website tonight. You'll be able to see all the really cool tricks and all the little um, nifty, infographics and videos that we've made to kind of help you understand why it's important to vote and why it's important to get out there and get registered and also how to do it as well so you won't be confused we have it in lots of different languages as well so don't worry if English isn't your first language um, we have a lot of different translations and ways that you can get involved as well so that's a really brief intro I had to keep it quick um, but I'll pass you over to Andreas he'll talk about the other kind of half of our campaign Thank you, Antonia, and good to see everybody. Uh, welcome to our panel. Uh, my uh, campaign is complementing what uh, Antonia, Antonia is doing and what uh, she has been talking about, but uh, I'm focusing on the, on the main political parties. Um, I would uh, highlight that uh, our campaign is cross-party. We are not supporting any candidates or any political parties. We are working across uh, the political spectrum. Uh, we have had conversations with uh, with uh, all the parties uh, in the last uh, five, six weeks. 
uh, I would say that uh, uh, some see more benefits of engaging with um, European EU citizen voters, uh, some don't. But uh, I think uh, we can also say that uh, either way, if you are a local politician, uh, you have to take into consideration the EU citizen voters at these local elections, because there are approximately four or five million EU citizens in the UK. We don't know the exact number, uh, unfortunately. Uh, what we do know is that uh, EU citizens have to apply for settled status, and so far, five million, more than five million uh, settled status applications were made uh, by EU citizens and their family members. So we don't know the exact number, but it's quite a big chunk of the of the, uh, the eligible population who can vote, uh, who are EU citizens. So I think that's why uh, these uh, EU citizen voters are important. They do not, there are no special requirements for EU citizens to register or to vote. They don't need to have a settled status or permanent residency, anything like that. Uh, they can vote just like uh, British uh, British people. Uh, so far, we have developed uh, a toolkit for the political parties. Uh, this is for them to use at uh, at a local level. Uh, you know, some some campaigners, some candidates are not really aware of the fact that uh, EU citizens can actually vote or how to engage with them, what issues matter to them. So we are trying to help um, all all the parties at the local level to, to engage with these voters. We are now moving in the second stage of our, of our project and uh, we are going to have, <clears throat> sorry, hostings uh, in three parts of the UK, of England, in Corby, Northampton and uh, Peterborough. So if you know anyone there or you are from there or you are active in any political party, uh, please get engaged get engaged, get in touch with us. Uh, we are you know, more than happy to work with, uh, with you. Um, I think that's it from me. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions later. Thank you, Antonia. Yes, perfect. Um, and yes, just as Andrea said, basically we're running, it's kind of like a two part campaign. The first part is engaging with political parties um, in an apolitical way, as Andrea has talked about. And the second part, which is what I'm focusing on a little bit more is grassroots. So we're working with engaging young people, again, just trying to make sure that they are make their voices heard. We have those three local areas, but we're also working on a national campaign. So that means England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So everybody's included um, as, as great as that is. Um, and I will pass it now over to um, Alexandra and Laura, who are the heads of the Young Europeans Network, which is another way you can get involved if you're really interested in, in making your voice heard and making sure that you can represent yourself as an EU citizen in the UK. Thank you, Antonia. Yes, yeah, so uh, we're a group, we're the youth wing of the 3 million and we campaign on the rights of EU citizens in the UK, but more generally on the rights of migrants as well. Our network is made of young people between the ages of 16 and 30, but actually we've made some exceptions as well there. Uh, and generally, I'll show you the sorts of campaigns that we work on right now. Cool. So yeah, we are the Young Europeans Network. Uh, our campaigns and the things that we do really focus on informing young people about their rights campaigning to make changes that will benefit them and providing them with training as well. We haven't been around for very long. We officially only launched on the 25th of September last year, but we've already done so, so much. We signed the Power of Youth Charter. We've been shortlisted for an award. We've hosted more than six webinars since this presentation was actually put together. Uh, these webinars have an average uh, um, audience of 100 guests. We get lots of questions, which really show the need for us to be there and answering young people and the questions that they have. We've grown to actually over 50 volunteers by now. We've created a TikTok account. We're getting lots of views there and reaching a completely new and different audience there. So if you're on TikTok, go help us out there. Uh, and in, on the campaigning as well, we've been writing letters to ministers and we've been highlighting some important issues that are affecting young Europeans in the UK. Um, our first campaign was the Our Home, Our Vote campaign. It started in August last year uh, when we were talking about basically an informative campaign on what local authorities do. So we had some videos showing inside a, a city council in Cambridge showing like what 
what authorities do. And we had the endorsement of councillors and an MP as well uh, for the, the purpose of uh, maintaining and expanding the right to vote in the UK. And now, of course, this campaign is, is being taken on by Andras and Antonia. Uh, similarly, we've got a campaign on access to British citizenship. As a lot of you probably know, it's very unaffordable to become a citizen in the UK. So through our campaign, we hope to address why people wanted to become citizens and the barriers in their way. So, so far, we've had some videos online and actually have spoken to some uh, in the media as well about this issue. And now I'll pass it on to Alexandra, who will tell you more about us. Thank you, Lara. Hello, I'm Alexandra and I'm the other co-chair of the Young Europeans Network. I'm also doing some uh, live tweets from this event. So if you're on Twitter or on social media, the hashtag is our home, our vote. So you can uh, tweet your insights from the event and what you learned from the panelists and your questions later on. So just to continue the presentation, the Young Europeans Network focuses a lot on access to information. So whether it's our campaign on citizenship or our voting rights campaign, we, rec we do recognize there is a, an issue of lack or limited information, especially to young migrants in the UK. So all our campaigns have this informative element to it, including our voting rights campaign. So for instance, now uh, I get a lot of comments from EU citizens saying, well, I didn't know that I could still vote after Brexit. Uh, and actually EU citizens can vote in 2021. So it's very important. Every campaign has this informative um, element. Um, then we also have uh, different campaigns on students' rights, citizenship as well, which also have this informative element and we often do Q&A with immigration lawyers and receive a lot of questions and then go in to produce Q&A documents and so on. Next slide, please. I'll be quick with it today. <laughs> um, I think also Lara mentioned what we try to do is actually reach youth audiences in different ways. So a lot of the campaigning groups or the charity sector and migrant charity sector in the UK focuses on different social media, but are really trying to get more youth audiences following content on citizens' rights, including developing a TikTok account, but also just translating very complicated and illegal information into accessible videos, infographics or other formats that are actually um, interesting for young people to engage with. So we have every week we do a Q&A video answering a common question from young people and EU citizens about their rights in the UK uh, called EU Question Time. We do a lot of TikTok videos, Instagram posts and so on just with this purpose of making information really accessible for youth audiences. Next slide please. And then we also have uh, over 50 volunteers at the moment and all a lot of our volunteer network is based on actually training, so involving young people who want to make a difference on EU migrant rights in the UK and actually providing them not only with ideas and campaigns to work on, but also with training to, for actually for young people to actually be able to develop their skills in policy writing, in community engagement, social media training, and very practical skills like video editing or making infographics and so on for them to be able to actually become the future generation of young leaders and migrant rights campaigners in the UK sector, migration sector more broadly. And finally, we also engage volunteers for different events. We do pub quiz, for example. We do different fun quizzes, game nights, and social evenings. So if you're a young person listening uh, 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 now um, to us, this panel, and you want to be involved and make a difference on voting rights or on any other campaign, you can join us, and we're a lot of fun as well. So the question remaining is what next? And this is what perhaps today addresses as well, because one of the what next campaign is actually our A team, Andras and Antonia, who are working on the voting rights campaign, but also in the future, our network will develop. I mean, in the next few months, a lot of our campaign on citizenship and also engage more young people to be the change they want to be on citizens' rights and in the UK more generally, because as the slogan says, this is our home, our vote and our voice matters in this. So I'll end there. Uh, I'll post some links on the chat about how to join the network if you're interested. And if you like, if you have someone that would like to provide training as well, we're happy to hear from you. I'll pass it back to the people that you came to hear from today. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. And I will stop talking really soon, I promise. We'll get right into the actual panel. Um, I know everyone is itching to hear from them. I am as well. So um, thank you so much, Alexandra and Laura, um, for that brief presentation. Again, if you're interested in joining the um, Young Europeans Network, there'll be links in the chat. Um, our last thing before we get stuck into it is very exciting. So we're going to be launching our website. Um, 
right now. <laughs> Basically, this is a website that we're working on for the campaign. This is the first time that anyone has ever seen it. So it's super exciting. Um, you guys are all the first people to be able to see it. And here we go. Here it is. Yay. It's so pretty. Um, so basically, if you're interested in learning about how to register to vote and you actually want to go and register to vote, which obviously I highly encourage, there's a lot of different reasons why you should, for example, improve your credit score, which is a personal, um, you know, benefit, but also you can make your voice heard in your society and make sure that your bins are cleaned in your local council, where you can learn and, and get more involved in politics. So there's lots of different reasons to get um, involved and to get registered. It takes five minutes to do and it's super, super easy. Um, so we have made this fun little website to help you understand how to get involved. Um, you can click register to vote right here in this handy little button um, and it will take you straight to the government website. We have a countdown of how many days you have left so you you know that you're in the in the good so we have 49 days at the moment. Um, we'll have a little bit of information about why you should register, why it's super important. Um, if you're interested and able to donate, then we encourage you to donate as well because, um, you know, it always helps us to be able to run the campaigns that we do and get more people involved. Um, we have some statistics to talk about, you know, um, again, like how important this is to make sure that you are um, active and you are involved. Um, and of, of course, other little links to make sure that you can kind of get involved in terms of, you know, joining our different events. We're going to be hosting a EU Citizens Festival Week um, in about a month, which is super, super exciting. You hear a lot more information about that on our social media um, and, you know, a lot of different events just to encourage people to, to get involved and get their voices heard. So basically that is our website. We will put the link below. You can check it out later and we will get right into the actual panel today, which is super, super exciting. So. I want to introduce our wonderful panelists. Um, first of all, thank you so much for everyone for um, volunteering to be here today. You guys are all so brilliant. I'm super excited to hear from you as well. Like, I remember when I was looking up like different people I wanted to contact for this panel, I was like, okay, who's going to be super influential? Who's going to make sure that the, the youth actually want to come and hear them? I was like, okay, I know exactly who to contact and this is great. So I'm so glad all of you guys said yes and took the time to come today. That's absolutely fantastic. You all, you guys are all great. Um, so I will introduce you, um, all our different panelists so you have a little bit more information about them if you're not sure who they are. Um, and then we'll start getting into the actual questions. In terms of logistics of how this is gonna work, I have a few different questions that we have um, kind of been sent in beforehand when we put up our uh, post about the different questions that you guys wanted to hear. And then we're gonna have an open Q&A. So if you have any questions that you want to either ask, you know, me or Alex or Laura or Andreas about the campaign, feel free to put those in the Q&A. Um, and then if you want to ask any specific questions to specific panelists, again, put those in the Q&A as well. You can put them in the chat if you want to. If you put them in the Q&A, they're more likely to be read by us and, and to be um, read out loud. The one thing I do say to everybody listening, make sure that you have the name of the panelist or the name of the person that you are asking the question to in the question. And if it's a more general question to all, just write you know to all so we know who to ask a question to. So it's just a little bit of logistics. Okay, so. First of all, we have Scott McGlynn, who's from Wales. Um, can you wave for us just so that everybody knows who you are? Fantastic, hello. Um, so, so, so great to have you. So Scott is a Welsh author. He's an LGBTQ activist, podcast host, and online lifestyle creator. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Scott? Yes, sure. Uh, yeah, Scott McGlynn, that's my name. And then, yeah, I am based in Wales. Um, but yes, like you said, I, I've done a couple of things on my career. Um, yeah, author. I first started, I brought, I brought my book out and it was like a memoir of like coming out in school. I think that's how I kind of got the ball rolling in my career. Then had a podcast show and then, yeah, like online creating come with it. And then I'm just doing more presenting. And then I'm just actually getting into acting now. That's like my new thing. So, you know, we're getting the whole round. The only thing I can't do is sing, you know? <laughs> That's so great. That's so great. And speaking <laughs> of singers, that actually brings us to our next um, panelist. I can see him smiling already. Jermaine, do you want to wave? Um, we have Jermaine, who's a very famous singer. He won The Voice in 2014, um, which just proves how great he is. But he's also a fantastic political, political activist. And he really, really works to make sure that all young people um, in England make sure that their voice is heard. Um, he's done some incredible work. So Jermaine, do you want to introduce yourself? Good afternoon, good night, wherever you're joining in the world. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Jermaine Jackman, uh, and it's great to be here. Uh, one thing to, to say that I am now an author as well. 
uh, I've got a children's book coming out in June, July time, and it's uh, on Windrush. Uh, so yeah, have a look at that when it's out. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for Jimmy for, for being here. Um, so next up in our panelist line, we have Cara Hunter, who I went to school with. I know Cara, she's great. Um, so one of my personal favorites, she's just a fantastic person, but she um, is actually one of the youngest MLAs in Northern Ireland, and she's been crazy successful and really, really making sure that young people's voices are heard in Northern Ireland, you know, campaigning, having lots of really successful careers, such as making sure that um, students are represented and have their, um, you know, represented in terms of, of a financial budget. She was able to secure from the government, an active mental health advocate, um, and just brilliant person. So, Cara, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, that's so kind. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Yes, um, I'm Cara, Cara Hunter. Um, my story is I was elected at 24 as a councillor and I was deputy mayor for uh, Derry and Straban, which would be Northern Ireland's um, second, second largest um, city. And recently I've been um, put in the position of a member of the Legislative Assembly. So I'm a politician for the constituency of East Derry. So just as Antonia has said, um, I ran predominantly on the ticket of mental health and suicide prevention. So that's something I'm very passionate about. And now I'm really intrigued about Scott's podcast and Jermaine's book. So it's lovely to be here and I look forward to hearing all about your stories. Thank you for having me. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, so many great, great, great um, actual influencers and activists here. It's It makes me feel very proud to be part of this call. Um, another fantastic activist and youth influencer is Josephine. Um, she's done some fantastic work on environmental rights and sustainability, um, and she has a podcast as well. Um, it's really, really interesting called Yikes. You should all check it out on Spotify. Um, Josephine, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, my name is Josephine. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a climate activist um, and generally, I guess, um, advocate for yeah, climate justice, uh, social justice, refugee rights, um, and general like collective liberation. Uh, I have a podcast and I'm a master student on degrowth and feminism. Um, and yeah, I'm based in Scotland. I've been here for five years. I'm German originally. Um, and yeah, that's, I guess, why I'm also so politically active. Uh, having a German background, I guess, makes me very, like I was raised in, you know, like silence is complicity in when you face oppression. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. Fantastic, and thank you for being here. And again, talking about like empowering people and the rights of you know women and refugees um, and just political active activists uh, activism in general. The next person that I would like to introduce is Diva. Um, thank you so much, Diva, for coming. She is a lawyer. She's done fantastic work in in women's rights, um, making sure that you know people are free from harassment, from discrimination. Um, she's done some brilliant, brilliant work. So, Diva, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Oh, such an amazing panel to be part of. Um, yeah, so my name's Diva. Um, I'm a, an employment lawyer and I specialise in harassment and discrimination. Um, I originally kind of started my activism in politics and I was doing a lot of work in that and uh, kind of noticed it's a bit of a sexist environment. Um, and then... <laughs> Uh, kind of went on to um, train as a lawyer and um, join an organization and after the Me Too movement kind of happened and the Time's Up movement, um, I started an advice line for women who have been sexually harassed in the workplace and um, sort of just built from there doing women's rights advocacy and doing what I can to eliminate violence against women and girls in the world. Fantastic. And these are our, our fantastic panelists. Um, again, thank you so much for the panelists for being here today. This is wonderful. Um, and now we're going to start getting into the meat of it. I'm super excited to hear all of your opinions and all of your voices on our different questions that we have today. So um, we've introduced, introduced ourselves a little bit already, but I would love to know from each of the panelists, and I'll kind of go around and call out different people, um, what um, what kind of advice would you give to students um, who are listening and are inspired by, you know, the fact that we're all so young, but you guys have gotten to some fantastic positions and you've been able to kind of use um, your voices to influence other people. Uh, I'd love to know, like, how you how you got to where you are and um, what advice you would give to people who are interested in being just as influential as you guys are. So we'll start off with Scott. Go ahead. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I think when I started my career, I think I came off just sharing my story. So I think that's, and obviously I come from a very personal level, um, which thankfully it was inspired to a lot of people or different ages as well. Cause I was, my story was from a young age when I was 14. Um, but it hit, you know, the, the teenagers and also a lot of people in my age group. So, um, yeah, I think that really got it spread it out there, what I was doing and what I was about and kind of what I was like fighting for. And um, yeah, I think that's how it kind of sp spiraled for me. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that was the, that was the question, right? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, Jermaine, anything to add to that? Yeah, I often, I'm, I'm often asked time and time again, like, why are you so political, Jermaine? Like, you're a singer, you've toured the world, you've sold albums, like, why, why, why politics? Um, and I think, for me, it was politics first. It was about being aware of my surroundings. It was about being active and having a voice on what goes on in my local community. I, wrote, I grew up around a lot of uh, gang violence, stabbings and shootings, and I've lost a number of friends to that. Um, and I wanted to do something about it. But also, being a black man in London is inherently political <laughs> in, 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 what, in a white supremacist world that we live in. It is inherently political. And I often am speaking up um, and amplifying the voices of some of the most marginalized of communities, um, amplifying the work of amazing um, charities as one domestic violence um, uh, charity here in Hackney, Sister Space, who do a phenomenal work. Um, and it's about amplifying the great work that they do. So for me, winning the voice was was just a, a, a plus because I was able to then use my platform to, 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 to uplift some of the great organizations, the great work some of the individuals do around the country and around the world. Um, and that's why I'm so into politics. And that's why I want to use my voice to try and create a fairer, better society for all, a, a world where people can reach their full potential and connecting that to what the topic of today is about, ensuring that we have a stake in our democracy. Yeah, definitely. Um, oh my goodness. It's always so important to use that kind of panel that you have and use that um, position that you have to be able to amplify not only your voice, but the voices of other people as well. So that's fantastic to hear. Um, Cara, I know that you have had a really interesting journey to get to where you are. Um, would you like to share that for everyone who, who perhaps doesn't know? Sure, yep. So uh, I'm currently 25. Uh, and it was I was 23 when I had first considered venturing into politics. Um, in Northern Ireland, obviously, we have a very uh, interesting and fragile kind of political landscape. Um, and initially, I had turned 18. And I wasn't I wouldn't claim myself to be political at the time. Uh, sadly, in 2017, I had lost my best friend to suicide, he had taken his own life. And I looked at our government and I thought to myself, no, this isn't good enough. We need more funding into mental health. We need to look at the different, you know, barriers to access to mental health, shame, stigma, the rural factors, um, you know, and all the different things that are blocking people from receiving care. So um, I kind of did uh, a lot of work around looking at, obviously, Northern Ireland had troubles, the troubles from the 1960s right through to the 1990s. Um, my age group as a 25 year old were called the ceasefire generation were born into post conflict society. Um, so ironically, I do the one thing now in my job, uh, which is I advocate for young people to get politically engaged. Um, sometimes in Northern Ireland, young people, uh, it was it was seen as shameful if you were political, it was seen almost as tribalism. And now we kind of see this new era of young people coming through saying no, I'm passionate about my community. I'm passionate about my people. Uh, and we want to see as Jermaine has said, a more fair and equal society. Um, and for me, my advice would be um, to young people considering going forward, go for it. It really is that simple. Uh, your voice is just as important as those older and those more male voices. Um, I, I'm the youngest in the assembly. So oftentimes I think people perceive voices of the youth as perhaps inexperienced, they lack wisdom, but they're innovative, they're creative. They see things in new lights, uh, a new light and new ways. And I think Diva touched on something really important there is barriers. 
uh, that women experience in the workplace and certainly in my time as a politician so far there still is that element of women can't and I think that's one thing so I, I would tell young people if they're thinking about getting politically involved or engaged in their communities running for an election go for it and you can be part of the change of changing the culture of harassment and the culture around women and young people getting into politics. Definitely, definitely. And just to add to what Cara said there, if you're ever, you know, interested in this, don't don't be hesitant to reach out. There's so many different places that you can kind of go to. You can go to a particular political party that you want to join. You can go to a group like ours, like the Young Europeans Network for more general kind of ways to get involved. There's so many different ways that you can get involved. Um, both in politics and in an apolitical way if you're just interested in learning more so there's always ways to get involved so i'm super super happy that that Cara said that um also in terms of this idea of you know learning from the society and trying to break through those barriers um diva i would love to hear more about how you know you got to where you are i know there's a lot of um law students actually who are watching today so i know that they'd be very interested to hear how you got you know where you are and the the different successful campaigns that you've been leading over the past few years um, well, how would I get here? Um, I just want to pick up on something that Jermaine said, which is something, you know, this, this phrase comes from the beginning of the sort of feminist movement, and it is that um, the personal is political. Um, politics is always personal, and I think it sounds like most of us have like taken the sort of issues that have affected us personally in our lives and use that as kind of fire in our bellies to motivate us and keep us going and I think that is where the drive comes from because I think we're so connected to our issues and it's it's not just something we're doing for fun it's just you know it is you know comes your life um so yeah um what I'd say as well is um I think um the other thing I would say is that I've got my parents are immigrants and immigrant parents are pushy and they want their kids to do the best. And um, I was sort of raised to believe that I was very lucky, lucky to have every single opportunity I had. Um, you know, my mum came here from Italy in the 70s and, you know, she couldn't speak English. Same as my dad, um, who came from Pakistan and, you know, the only reason that you know a story like that could exist if it was you know was because of the EU and um they came here to create opportunity for themselves and I felt like you know that I am the sort of completion of that dream and I feel a lot of responsibility to make sure that I access those opportunities and make the most of what I can do um and yeah just to pick up on something else you said Jermaine about um sort of inherently political things I think and something you said, Cara, about um, there's so much sexism and racism and all of these kind of structural inequalities in our society, whether they be poverty or they be discrimination based. And I think we're only sort of beginning to scratch the surface about how, how all of these things are interrelated. So like you talked about Sister um, Space, which is this like, incredible organization um, who help uh, black women in Hackney who are victims of domestic abuse. And when you start to kind of look at the way that those kind of services have been treated, you begin to see that we're not only trying to get, you know, we're not trying, we're, we're trying to kind of unravel structural racism, but also structural sexism. And a lot of the work I do supporting women I'm helping a lot of migrant women who experience additional barriers because maybe English isn't their first language um, but they just don't understand the legal system they don't know their rights and they are specifically targeted they are specifically targeted by um, people who want to take advantage of them because they know that they don't have an equal footing or they won't have the ability to kind of fight back in the way that other people will. Um, and I think a lot of people don't know that this is happening in all kinds of workplaces. Um, so in terms of my advice, what I would say, obviously register to vote, get really political active, the kind of the, the sooner you bite the, you know, get bitten by the bug, like the more, you know, it never kind of leaves you. And then um, the other thing I would say is join a trade union, um, join a trade union, um, because then you won't have to call up an organization like mine and understand your, your legal rights as much. And, and especially if you're a migrant person, please, please, please join a union. And if you don't know which one, just you can DM me, I'll help you figure it out. But um, this is like, 
we kind of we're operating in a system which benefits from you not knowing your rights and not enacting them and that's why it's so important the you know the personal is political the political is personal it works both ways um so yeah <laughs> Oh, I just couldn't unmute there. Uh, yes, completely. That is it's so, so, so important. And you guys are also fantastic. This is I'm going super well. Um, yes, it's so important to, you know, register to vote, to join a trade union, to try and educate yourself in as much way as possible. Um, and, you know, join different groups that are in different languages, um, join different support groups, um, just so that you know that you won't be taken advantage of, because unfortunately, that is such a common thing um, nowadays, but it really shouldn't be. So trying to spread the word and trying to raise awareness as much as possible so that we can kind of defeat that is the overall aim um, of all of our joint efforts. So I'm glad that, you know, we're talking about this because it's it's so important. Um, another super important thing that we haven't mentioned as of yet, but I'm really glad to um, be passing this to Josephine because I know she's a super expert on this, is environmental issues and how important it is as well to talk about that and to talk about sustainability and how young people can get involved in, you know, climate um, active, active ugh, activism that's a really hard word to say I keep messing up um climate activism so Josephine I'd love to hear how you got where you were and what kind of um advice you would give young people who are interested in joining you know uh, climate rallies and things like that um yeah it's super interesting to hear everyone's like story how they got involved I think for me like as I alluded to earlier like being being German and being also a white woman um, and of non-Jewish background. Um, I think the way that I was raised from my parents, but also from my local community was that, as others have said, like, you know, existing is politic, po like political. And for me and like the space that exists uh, and my body, the way that it exists also as a cisgendered woman um, has a lot of privilege and therefore needs to be uh, whilst dismantling that privilege needs to be politically active because it is so safe for me to do that and you know having I guess for me that's always been such a big thing of like I live in countries where voting is literally one of the easiest things actually to do because of my freedom because of my um, situation in these countries and therefore I guess something that I've always thought is actually voting is one of the easiest things for me to do and I guess that's where like my activism comes from because um, for me and the way that I'm situated in my local community now, even being, you know, um, of German citizenship in Scotland, um, I am generally perceived as, um, you know, having having a voice and being able to use that voice. And so for me, I guess, like my activism has always been a bit more of like shit stirring and political spaces. Um, I really enjoy going to the council and kind of, yeah, I guess, holding a speech that no one expected or, you know, my... My local MP gets an email from me once at least a week. <laughs> but um, so I guess like for me, I um, I find that really important because I guess when when those with certain privileges work on dismantling those whilst also advocating for voices that are, that are politically not heard and are politically actively silenced, I feel like that's like one of the ways that we can actively engage. And I guess climate change for me is, you know, it's just like it is, it comes from, other injustices that comes from colonialism and racism and class issues and patriarchy and capitalism and therefore like for me that's like where the intersection for me that I want to tackle and um, you know we can do anything from politically organizing in our local communities in going green and you know looking at like our infrastructure and everything but also targeting the UK government in general you know like of how we as a community have the depth in environmental issues and uh, are still benefiting off colonial and current instruct like you know resource extractions and stuff so for me like climate change is where a lot of these things are visualized um structural barriers and structural injustices but um yeah and also i guess where a lot of the hope for me comes from because that is where communities mobilize a lot especially in current times so yeah that's kind of for me <laughs> Yes, and that's so important to mention as well. I love your your phrase of like, you know, stirring everything up. But I think like kind of building what Kara said as well is this idea of we, we as young people aren't um, kind of given enough credit, you know, so kind of have to make a noise. We have to stir things up, even just to be recognized and even just to kind of make our voices heard. You have to kind of be radical in in whatever term that that that's um, 
has, you know, um, and this idea of, of what exactly is radical nowadays, um, it's kind of, it's kind of ridiculous, something that says is radical is, is not, but anyway, we're, we're moving on. Um, the next question that I want is just to kind of um, open up to the floor, because we've, we've touched on this a little bit, but I'd love to hear um, the panelists' ideas, so I'm not going to call on any panelists specifically, but if you're interested, just on my on mute and start talking, and I'm sure if we have too many people, it's okay, we'll figure it out, um, but it's just kind of a broad question of um, why voting is important to you and why you think that young people specifically um, should get out and, and, and vote. would love to hear um, what you guys think about that. There's always that awkward silence, so I'm going to break it. <laughs> um, and I'm going to answer one of the questions that came into uh, the Q&A. But I'll start off by saying there's a, there's a quote that says, the right to vote is the most powerful non-violent tool you have in a democracy. It's the most powerful non-violent tool you have for change. And that's why white male governments and countries throughout the century have prevented other groups from having it. That's why only in the last hundred years or so, we've seen women get the right to vote. That's why oppressive and, and, and dictators have prevented other people in their countries from having that right to vote. Because it is the most powerful tool. I'm very passionate about ensuring uh, ethnic minorities, I call them global majorities actually, ensuring black and global majorities have that right to vote. Here in this country, we're seeing voter ID being rolled out across the country and it's shown, it's shown in, in America how that's used as a tactic to suppress votes, to prevent people from going to the, 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 the polling stations. We've seen how, how, how governments are behaving because they know that the right to vote is the most powerful tool that we have. So they're gonna do every single thing that they can to prevent you from using that. We're simply saying, if you wanna roll out voter ID, then give out free national ID cards. How about that? There are families struggling who can't actually afford 80 pounds for a passport who can afford 45 pounds for a driver's license. The statistics say that 74% of white British people have a driver's license. Only 30, was it 31% for the Asian community and 46%, 48% for black people in this country. We see the disproportionalities there. So why are they still pushing on this narrative when only one person has been convicted of election fraud? You have to ask yourselves these questions. I won't talk for long because I, I really want to hear all the other panelists, but I will end with um, answering the question in, in the Q&A, asking me, um, how do I combat people who say, well, you're just a singer, stick to singing. We've seen Marcus Rashford speak out and how they said to him, you're just a footballer, stick to playing football. We've seen other, Stormzy and Dave, what do you know about politics? You're just a rapper, stick to rapping. And I've got a poster, I, will turn, I won't turn my camera around because my room's kind of messy, but I've got a poster and it's from Paul Robeson. And he says, as an artist, I come to sing, but as a citizen, I would always speak up for peace and no one can silence me on this. And that's so powerful because regardless of what you do, regardless of what career path you go down, regardless of, of who you choose to love, because you are a human being, you have a right to decide and have a say in how our world moves forward. Because you are a citizen, you have a right and a say in how this country is governed. Because of that, I don't care what you do. I don't care who you fall in love with. Because you are a human being, you decide. You have a right to decide. And I will end with this. Any, I don't want to hear anyone complain to me about what the government does if you haven't voted. If you choose not to vote, do not complain. Don't complain. Don't come to me and say, oh, I can't believe the government. Has oh, did you vote? No, I didn't vote, but I can't believe. No, then you, you, don't, you silenced yourself in that matter. So therefore you silence yourself now. 
You don't, you can't tell me anything. You didn't vote. So do not be silenced. Do not allow the governments or, 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 or the wealthy and the richest or the most powerful in our societies to dictate what we can and cannot do. Use your right to vote because people have fought and died. Women have fought and died. Black people, global majority, have fought and died for this right to vote. Don't just waste it. Ah, it was so powerful. Oh my goodness, it was absolutely wonderful. And you're so right. I mean, we don't talk about these things in the way that we should, you know. I think there's a lot of different reasons why um, people don't vote, but the one that we kind of find the most is one, either they don't realize that they can vote, and that's usually with, with EU citizens in the UK, for example, not understanding that, you know, they are eligible to vote and they can they can get involved. Um, but the second is that um, thing that you're touching upon where people don't think that their vote matters. They think that, oh, they're just kind of one in millions um, and what what you know they won't miss me but you know if a lot of people think like that and suddenly you have millions of, of people not voting and i'd love to hear the panelists ideas on that how, how do you think this was actually a question that we got sent in um how do we convince um ap apathetic um voters that they have real real world impacts with with their vote that their vote does matter can i come in yeah, so um, I, I think one of the saddest things that I've seen is in Northern Ireland from 18 to 30 year olds, over 50 percent, um, I believe it's just around just over 50 don't, they're not registered to vote. So I think by looking statistically, evidently we have a huge problem. Um, but, but I think what's really interesting, and Jermaine's touched on this, is when we think about the power of a vote, um, you know, a vote is a right, you know, what a blessing other parts of the world people aren't given that gift. Um, and for me, uh, as a Catholic woman in Northern Ireland, um, you know, we fought long and hard for the vote, one man, one vote, uh, and for that level of equality. So I feel almost a democratic duty, because uh, I know how hard my ancestors fought um, for equality here. So I feel there's a real level of um, obligation to, to be aware and educated on the power that my vote has, but to also pass that on to others. Um, in school, uh, politics really wasn't something that they had talked about enough and about the power of the vote. Um, so I think, um, you know, as we move forward, something you've really uh, done very well with this is your engagement online through social media, TikTok, you know, all these different platforms that young people, you know, so in, a, in a 10 second clip you can get through to them like that the world's changing in that way people want snappy quick information so um i think definitely if we look statistically and especially in the most deprived areas um you know looking at the north here it's a really sad because we see that people in the most deprived areas are less likely to vote and it's about voter mobilization and and going into these areas and you know advocating and empowering people and saying you have your right your voice and to step up and to use it Definitely, yeah. absolutely. Is there any other panelists? Odiba, do you want to go on ahead? Sorry, I got all over excited. Um, yes, I completely agree. And I think this is a, you know, this campaign is, it's not just about young people as well. I mean, um, we're talking, this is such a, this campaign means so much to me because my mum, you know, she's lived in this country for 40 years. She didn't even know that she could vote in the local elections until I became politically active and told her. She just assumed that she had absolutely no stake, no say, you know, she couldn't vote in the Brexit um, vote. She felt completely disenfranchised and I completely see that powerlessness and I saw that on her face and the kind of helplessness that I can't control any of these major decisions that are happening to this country that will affect me personally and there I am trying to sort out her settlement you know um, scheme stuff because she can't do it and she couldn't even download the app um, and we just put this like enormous like pressure like this enormous burden on people like we basically just changed their entire lives even though you know my mom's lived here the majority of her life you know she's lived here 40 years and she always felt like an outsider and then this happened and it was just like right you're even less of a citizen than you thought you were so it's like incredibly um disempowering but I think what is so important, and I think both of you have just touched on this, is just like voting is power. It is 
power you can reclaim that power back but as long as you do it but you can't just do it yourself you need to persuade all your friends to do it you need to persuade a group of people to do it because collectively you can have power you can have influence when it is just you it doesn't feel like you can but that is you know this is the same thing about the trade unions or, or something like that there is power in being a collective and young people don't get listened to by politicians because they don't vote. They don't vote in high turnouts and therefore politicians overlook what they need and what they want because they are not seen as uh, an influential voting block. But I've got news for you, okay? We just had this big pandemic and it is disproportionately hit young people. Disproportionately, youth unemployment is insane. Um, I mean, the, the exams fiasco, the, the world has, as they know it, has changed for young people. Um, so, and everybody gets that. Everybody knows that young people have been disproportionately impacted by this, right? So everyone knows that you've, short, you've all pulled the short straw here. Um, but what does that mean? It means that your voice now has become one of the most important voices, because if we are gonna build back from this pandemic, it's gonna be young people that have to be at the forefront communicating their needs, their problems, um, and being that advocate for their the people that you know their friends and the people who affects them. Um, so everybody gets that you're getting a raw deal. So I think now you can use that experience and kind of say, look, this is what we need to do to make things better for us who are who are going to be you know the the most hard hit by this. Um, and yeah, and then and then I think you know what you will find is that politicians will listen to you more if they are more, um, if they are convinced that you will come out in numbers, if they are convinced that you are a group that is worth um, you know catering to, and and that's unfortunately how politics works. But right now it can feel like uh, young people are really sidelined. But I think historically that isn't true. I think we are just kind of young in an age where young people haven't been seen as very politically important but if you look at the sort of student political movement they have been at the forefront of changing the world um civil rights movement the feminist movement everything you know this all came out you know so much of this came out of um student movements and you're seeing a bit of that revival in the in the renters strike um that's happening at the moment so i don't believe for one second that um young people um you know are, are some sort of irrelevant voice i feel like this is actually like you know probably the most important time ever i know we, that's a really overused phrase but i really believe this is actually the most important time ever for young people to be active and that starts you know by voting Absolutely, absolutely. And I don't think it's it's overused. If anything, I think it's always an important time to be able to try and get involved. And like, the more you you get involved, and more you get active, that's when you start a movement. And you know, it doesn't, you don't have to wait to start a movement, you can do it right now. And um, you're right, we're in the kind of right situation and right environment to really kind of make that impact. So now is a better time than ever. Um, it's absolutely, absolutely crucial that people make sure that they register. Also, for any young people who are under 18 who are watching, you can still register um, from the age of 16 in um, England, in Wales, in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, I think so as well. You don't have to, um, you won't be able to vote until you're 18, but you can get registered now and then you'll know that when your time comes, when you're old enough, you can just get out and vote and you're on that register. Um, and also you can kind of get involved with the Young Europeans Network. We accept people who um, aren't eligible to vote yet um, and help kind of get them engaged. You can kind of get involved in other ways as well. Um, but the next question that I have, and just for everybody who's watching as well, if you have questions, we're gonna open it up to the general question section now. So put your questions in the Q&A function or in the chat if you can't figure out the Q&A section. Um, and we will be looking through them and we will be asking the panelists and um, also Alexandra, Lauren, Andreas about the actual campaign. But also if you have any specific questions for panelists, now is the time to put them into the chat. Um, the last kind of question that I have for the panelists is, you know, I chose you all because you guys have all um, had a really good example to give young people of a campaign or an issue that was really important to you that you worked on, you fought for, and you succeeded, you know? So I'd love to hear from each of you um, 
what how that felt you know working really hard and fighting for you know the issue that you all believe in um and i know there are a lot of different issues here which is great because they're all super super important and the idea of intersectionality as well um how you can't just tackle one thing without understanding the complexities of all the other um intersectional um different issues that are going on um and the structural aspects of it as well but the main question i have for each of the panelists is one, how did it feel fighting um, for it? What were the ups and downs? And how did it feel when you succeeded? Tell us specifically the issue that you worked on and how um, how you did it, basically. Um, we'll start with Scott because he hasn't talked in a while. Hey, hey, <laughs> hello. Uh, yeah, recently, actually, I just did a campaign called Just Like Us, which is based in Wales. And um, is this one was very, they approached me and this one was very important because uh, I come from school. From a, I'm a gay guy. I come from a bad bullying side of school for five years of my life. And this campaign approached me last year, and it was for youth, like youth groups in schools, just to have more support. Because obviously, I went through school and didn't have anything like that. So it's a very LGBT uh, base uh, kind of campaign for me, and um, you know. It, it was really important to me. I've, I've met a, a good couple of these uh, young uh, like people, students and things in school and I just love what they set up. I, I wish I could go back to school now and just be part of that because I didn't have any support at all growing up and it was very hard for me and it, it plays on your mental health so it was kind of that side of things people kind of forget about. Um, and lucky I come out from the other side from my kind of issues but I know a lot of stories that people haven't and then yeah and and then I get to I, I got to meet them and they're incredible they just have great just chats about you know dating and just just fun chats that I wish I had and um yeah just supporting each other all the way and and just being there for each other I think is so important and that that campaign um definitely will go again next year just it's, it's a lot more to fight for you know we're slowly getting there I you know growing up you know I know so many small things just even us getting married legally just could not come out long long ago so it's, it's, it's slowly coming like more and more for us but it's a long way to go and um yes it's, it's it was a very important campaign that one to me I've lived it wonderful and I'd love to hear from all panelists as well so just feel free to jump in um and tell us about your experience Yeah, I can I can go next if no one. Um, yeah, I think having campaigned on like a lot of different issues, like I find it, for example, very hard for me to just have like one specific thing because for me nothing is very linear. Even though I really admire people who have like that one campaign that they do for years, decades, sometimes, um, and you see that linear progress, possibly, hopefully, um, which. I feel like for me, um, because I look at a lot of different and I, I'm generally like advocating for general system change and um, I'm a lot more focused at grassroots organizing and um, therefore for me, I think because I feel a lot of outrage generally against the way that our government is doing their, I don't know how to put it nicely, um, <laughs> shit show, um, you know, like something that like, I guess like what sustains me is just community and and they have, and like as much as I often feel deflated and like outraged and all of these value, like all of these emotions are obviously super valuable because a lot of them fuel me and are also like in our political climate completely normal, I would say. Like if you're not outraged, then what, what are you doing? <laughs> but um, you know, I guess like what sustains me is community. And when we were, for example, organizing for the climate emergency declaration, which now has been a lot like greenwashed by our government, um, as expected, but um, you know, in the lead up to that, like just highlighting how different communities are affected and then, you know, like kind of like connecting different struggles. I think that's for me something that is generally so powerful. And that's why I would always say that, like, beyond voting, like get organized in your local communities and local grassroots organizing, because we need to be holding like, you know, governments accountable. Like it's not just voting in people. It is actually holding them accountable and looking at what they're doing, what they're not doing, and what are they doing behind closed doors when young people are often shut out. And for me, I think as often stressful that is, 
like seeing you know other people just like out of their free time they don't get any like money or anything for it you know just just doing things and that is like how we all also can find our talents like whether it's like music at a protest whether it's people bringing food like I think that's for me it's always something that sustains me and that feels like and that's when I also know like better worlds are possible and better worlds are on their way um so yeah I guess for me it's like less of like winning a campaign but it's knowing that people still show up regardless um Yes, that's so wonderful to hear. And I think that's so important as well. You know, a lot of young people are out there thinking, oh, I don't know what my passion is. You know, I, I really care about this, but I care about that and thinking that they have to choose and they don't, you know, so it's really important to, to know and to hear that you can be passionate about multiple things and you should use your voice for multiple things. You know, you don't just have to focus on one thing. If you have a focus, that's fantastic. Um, if you don't, that's also okay. So don't worry. Um, just being able to use your voice and whatever your voice says is okay, you know, as well. Um, so Cara, Jermaine, Diva, is there anything you'd like to add about, you know, your successes and again, like the, the issues that you fought for and succeeded with, um, would love to hear, hear your stories. Yeah, I'm happy to come in there. Um, so recently, um, one of the issues that we did see throughout the pandemic was the impact on students. Um, all aspects and sectors of society have been impacted, but I think students in the Northern Irish context, it was very unique. Um, certainly there's been a mental health impact as a result of COVID-19. It's undoubtable, we can see it firsthand. Um, but one of the things was uh, no part-time jobs, very difficult, businesses are shut. So students couldn't work, but they couldn't avail of benefits. Um, we had single mothers who there's no childcare facilities open. Um, and uh, I know someone who is a single mom of two children and is a student herself. So uh, she was teaching in the day and then teaching herself at night. So these kind of complexities, the government hadn't really considered or thought about. Um, my party and I, we conducted a survey. Uh, we had thousands of responses. We created a petition to lobby the economy minister um, and to represent the stories of the individuals on the ground first to the face of the minister to say these are real people they have rent to pay they have mouths to feed um, and just bring that that realness bring it to the chamber to the floor and say you know minister what are you going to do because that's what it all comes down to holding them accountable Josephine you made a fantastic point um, and, and on that um, people underestimate the power they have use social media and lobby I mean um, I'm a total control freak at work I read every email I like to know what people want um, and I like to put the opportunity out there I share my email all the time I say please like let me know what you want at a local council level at an assembly level um when you're a politician you're a public servant so if you're not serving you're doing something wrong so I always advise people to say come forward let me know what you want we have an open door policy uh when we're out of COVID at my office and I welcome people to just come in off the street and have a chat because you need that open communication that's what politicians are paid to do you know um, and I think there's that real lack of trust as well and I feel like it's my obligation to, to mend that bridge and to work with the public because that's at the end of the day um the reason that I am where I am but uh, another thing thing that I found um you know really I was really happy about was uh, I, I've been in my position for eight months uh, and I had lobbied the minister as a councillor the health minister and um, to improve funding for suicide prevention services in the northwest so historically um, funding in the northwest of Ireland has been uh, quite lackluster and not equal uh, to other parts of Northern Ireland. So um, we have a real chronic need here for, for improved mental health uh, support services. Um, so we had lobbied heavily with the health minister. He initially gives over £60,000 and then down the line give over £100,000 uh, to a local um, crisis centre. It was a community crisis intervention service and they essentially provide support, um, you know, from 8pm to 8am. So those kind of antisocial hours when someone may have suicidal tendencies and for me it was uh you know it was a mixture of people coming forward to let us know what they want a uh, sitting with people hearing their real life stories and telling people you know it's an open door through social media tweet me um you know post on my Facebook, DM me on X amount of platforms. We're here, we want to listen and we want to get results. Um, and just, just to really push that out there that, um, you know, engage in democracy because you can you can have that change. Even if you can't vote, I always say to young people, like anything you need, walk in the door um, and engage with your local politicians. 
Definitely. And that's just another way that young people can get involved as well. Um, I'm going to be starting to answer the questions. Um, so don't worry, I see your questions. We're, we're getting to them. Um, but I would love to hear from Jermaine and, and Deba about their experiences because I've read about them and they're fantastic. So I would love to be able to hear um, you guys just tell those, those stories just to encourage young people and understand that they can get to where you are as well, because all you have to do is um, make your voice heard. And um, yes, I'd love to hear your examples. I'll just say a short point about, um, um, I've been un involved in a lot of unsuccessful campaigns. <laughs> I've been involved in far more unsuccessful campaigns than I have in successful campaigns. And I think you need to be prepared for the fact that it's not gonna always be win, win, win. I see my work as um, I've joined a struggle, a struggle that's existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. And actually when I first got involved, um, I wanted to see results and you know I'm an impatient person that wants action now and actually the more I kind of do this work the more I've actually taken the time to educate myself about the work that has come before me and the shoulders that I stand on and you start to realize that a lot of these conversations you know you, you don't need to reinvent the wheel there are people who've been talking about these issues and looking at these issues for much longer than you've ever been politically active and when I sort of started to realize that I just you know it really kind of changed my whole perspective on it which isn't always I'm going to win I'm going to get results it's about being part of the struggle and accepting that you know real societal change takes time unfortunately um, but you need to kind of understand that and be prepared to do the long work and um, so while successes are great you have to be prepared as well that it's not going to be success after success sadly yeah of course and I'm so glad that you mentioned that as well because again um, when I think of success I think of like oh yes we, we finally won but is that that word finally is so important you know and I think it is really important to say that there are going to be so many times where you kind of fall but you have to get back up again you have to keep going and then you will succeed eventually you know it's a lot of different steps to be able to get to to that final um, final kind of platform you know um, Jeremy and I would love to hear your experience with that. Yeah, and I want to relate it to one of the questions that was put forward in, in the Q&A. Uh, Kara said something really interesting, such an important word, that there is power on the ground, grassroots organisations, grassroots organising and mobilising. And although, yes, it might be great, we've got those international campaigns, those national movements that get the headlines of the New York Times, and it's all wonderful and glitz and glamour, and that's phenomenal great but there's something about grassroots activism that is unlike any other form of activism there's something about working on the ground with those other organizations with those other individuals who are working to improve people's lives and that could be the smallest of things as um anti-social behavior in your local area or, or, or you don't like the side of the the road that a bin is on like it, it could be the smallest of things to the dog mess in your local park uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the massive headlines in the New York Times. It can be the local activism. And I think that's where a lot of my work has been over the past couple of years, working with local authorities. So I led two commissions, one in Hackney and one in Islington, with the aim of listening to the lived experiences of children and young people and using that to, to create policy. And one of the things that came up time and time again was gentrification. Children, young people who were being born and brought up in these inner boroughs in inner boroughs in London uh, no longer felt and no longer could identify with their own hometown could no longer identify with their local estate because you might have a luxury estate and my estates fall into pieces or you might have a luxury apartment that has poor doors where those who are privately renting can go into one entrance and access the private rented garden and those who have social homes going through a different entrance and can't enter the private garden these these homes are still here in London in 2021. So my thing in how to combat that was, well, why don't we change our thinking and have young people on the planning committee? They okay all the luxury apartments and the big developments that go on in Hackney. Now to a lot of local authorities, that's crazy young people. This is not a space for young people. This is not a space for the community. This is officers work. This is, this is councillor work. This is people who know the business. And I'm like, well, young people are experiencing your business. <laughs> young people know 
what affects them in their local community. Young people care about their local community and young people want to have a say in their local community. So as we, yes, it's important that we're talking up on that international and national level, but I can't stress enough, grassroots activism is unlike any other, where you can literally see how empowered children and young people are from the moment they complain about something, the moment they, they tell us an issue that they're facing, to the moment I bring it to the councillors in their chambers and they're voting on that same policy to change it. Young people have felt so empowered throughout that process. And it's those processes that, that, that we should be also focusing on. How can we stay on the ground? How can we help and improve the lives of those families who are really struggling? One of the things that I did, and I'll end with this, one of the things that I did um, during lockdown was COVID conversations with um, the mayor of Hackney. I wanted to bring a decision maker in Hackney to hear the voices of children and young people, because as you can see from our daily briefings, ain't no children and young people in that space. And they ain't talking about children and young people either. So I said, okay, cool. We need to have COVID conversations, center the voices of children and young people, first and foremost. And from that, we heard so much. This was at the beginning stages. So we knew Wi-Fi would be an issue for families. We knew outdoor spaces would be an issue for young people because young people were hanging in front of McDonald's to access the free Wi-Fi when the council thought they were causing antisocial behavior. I'm like, no, they're just here for the free Wi-Fi. But ultimately, one thing that really struck me was that there was a young, there was a young, uh, young woman who was pregnant and she was pregnant from a, a guy who, who was from a Caribbean background and their parents the, um, the young girl's parents did not agree to, to her going out and having a child with a black guy. So they kicked her out of the house. In the middle of a pandemic, she was living in a hostel and she was scared to go um, shopping. She was scared to leave the house because she didn't know, everyone was scared at the beginning of this pandemic. And if I hadn't created that COVID conversation space where you censor the voices of children and young people, her issue wouldn't have been heard by the mayor of Hackney and she wouldn't have been seen to. So it's about us understanding what is the feeling on the ground? How do we keep our ears to the ground? And how do we understand what children and young people are actually going through? So yes, as we're campaigning, and I want to say thanks to all the organizers for putting this on together. But as we're campaigning on that national and international level, let's remember, let's not forget about that grassroots activism. Yes, and that is so, so, so important. That brings us to a really um, good question that we have here in the chat, um, which is um, from Anonymous. It says that we've talked a lot about power and the privilege of a vote, um, but why should I care about having a vote in local elections? Why do local elections matter? Um, so I'd love to hear the panelists' um, views on that. So I know just from being politically active in my area, um, the councillors do all the work. MPs ask councillors to do their casework for them. Um, so, and lots of people going to their MP would be much better off going to their local councillor. Um, how it works is that the, the, the national government gives each local council a budget and then depending on the political makeup of the budget uh, of that council, they make political decisions on how that budget is going to be distributed and that affects public services and that affects the commissioning of services. So there is huge importance in that process which is very misunderstood and not transparent and a lot of people don't understand it or think it's important but actually they control who gets the money so what could be more important than that um, and that has, you know, if you look at, you know, Jermaine already mentioned it, but like Sister Space is an organisation that was affected by this. And there's been lots of domestic abuse charities and refuges who have been effectively shut down by councils. Um, and then that, you know, has impact on gender equality and that has impact on, um, you know, women who can't find safe spaces to go when they need help. So that translates into sort of real life impact um, much more so than um, nationally so of MPs unless you're in power um, unless you're the party in government a sort of opposition MP can't help you very much if your local MP is not in the government they can say yeah okay I can I can raise this point but um, they don't really have the power but if you are you can there there is more power to be found in the local council if you can change up the political makeup of that then you can change where all the the money goes 
Um, and I think that's really, really important point to make for migrant people as well, because they are much more likely to be interacting with public services. They are much more likely to have to use the services that are in their local area. So, you know, you know, even more so than most people, you should have a say on what those public services are that are getting funded. And, you know, and I say, you know, if you're not really sure what your um, council does, go on the website, go and look at your council website and, you know, understand it for yourself, because all the information is there um, if you want to find it. Um, and like there are some simple things that we may we think that are not important, but on the day to day life, it is the thing that affects us mostly. So like the, the, your bin collection, you may think, oh, it's just the bins, but actually it ends up how it is recycled. If you care about the environment, it depends on that. How many homes are available for local people? Not just how many, but if they're for rent or for ownership, that affects you, how they're distributed to the local people. Uh, on EU and settlement scheme, for example, some councils have been really proactive in directly messaging all of their residents, reminding EU citizens to apply. Others have just left people to their own. So if, again, like depending on who you vote for, you can pretty much change things that affect you on your day-to-day -day life and there's so much more that happens like your parks your local spaces community areas local gym things like that like you you use that every day so it, it does affect you and everyone should be looking into paying attention to that and, and registering and voting Definitely. And if any of the panelists want to come in on that, I'm going to ask another question, but feel free to, to you know, build it up with the previous question, just because I noticed that we're running out of um, time and there's some really, really interesting questions in the chat. Um, the next one that we have is, it's quite a long one, so I'll just read it quickly. Um, activism and politics seem to be something reserved for certain people. What do you think about, what do you think that needs to change um, so that working class, migrant communities, global majorities and other marginalized groups get involved politically? How can people get involved if they work very long hours or don't know much about politics or can't go to meetings or um, hustings or, or things where they would be educated on that? Um, how, how do you think that those people should go about getting involved? And briefly, um, I, I'm just going to say just just quickly because I'm mindful of time. Um, we I've become become aware of this since I've got in. Um, one of the problems is a lot of uh, parents who are perhaps single parents. Um, who would work every hour God sends can't get time to go into your office. So I've extended our office hours from, you know, around four o'clock to 6 p.m. just to give the grace of that extra hour and a half. We're thinking and actually extending it further just so that working parents have time to go home, feed the kids and then engage politically. And um, also I work um, with a group called the Northwest Migrants Forum and um, with an activist there called Lillian and uh, trying to identify ways to ensure that minority voices in Northern Ireland are heard and also what different mechanisms can I use as a politician to engage um, you know with individuals who perhaps you know English isn't their first language so we would have you know a significant Polish population here uh, within my constituency so we would always try and, and provide translations with political literature and things like that so um, definitely something I'm very mindful of and something I think all politicians should definitely take into account. Can I just say briefly on this as someone who is well involved in the three million bars of standing for election for the county councils in 2021. I think there's so many different barriers, especially to young people and migrants, just in terms of how uh, the structures are actually built, because it's no coincidence really that the average age of councillors is over 50. Because I mean, at least in my area, a lot of the meetings actually in the county councils are during the day. So if you have a job or you have long hours to work, like how are you going to actually engage? But I think the very first step is actually actually having access to information. I'm one of the many, many EU citizens. When I arrived in the UK, I had no idea I could vote in the local elections. It took me four years and finding out from friends and different sources that I can actually have those rights and I can use them. So I think, you know, we really need to start with the informative campaign and actually think about how we can adapt our structures to enable participation from different groups that won't be available for a 10 a.m. meeting or won't be available too many hours a week or just try to work around how can we actually get more diverse I mean I, there's always I'm in endless meetings about let's get more women candidates let's get more ethnic minority candidates let's get more diversity in the politics but we also need to work on the structures of politics to actually enable people with different patterns of involvement to actually be able to participate and get their voice heard but that's 
yeah, just keeping it very short, I have I can write an entire book and commentary on that that issue. Can I quickly add on that? Um, yeah, also, I guess when you are in movements and organizing spaces and, you know, if everyone looks exactly like you, especially as um, like white, for example, like the climate movement in the UK is extremely whitewashed at this point um, and extremely white centered. And I guess, you know, like look around, like if everyone looks like you, like what are the barriers that your movement has created? that pushes other people out because it's not true that other groups like non-white people for example don't want to come into politics and local councils or also you know like or like women and um, these barriers are created systemically and if you are in those spaces and you benefit from these spaces then it's your turn now to like look at how to dismantle them and um, create spaces that are safe and you know um, I guess and the calls of those groups are out there of what we have to do um, and I guess that's like something that we can do, even when we aren't, aren't like, you know, able to, because of all, also like everyone obviously faces some type of barriers, whether it's long working hours and stuff, but putting it into context, um, creating spaces that are welcoming, accessible and safe, uh, and also stepping out of other spaces for safe spaces for other groups to exist, I guess is key. Definitely, definitely. And that's so important as well. It's like, exactly, you look around when you're campaigning, look around, see who's not there and see of how to bring them um, there, you know, um, and also understanding when to take a step back as well. You know, um, I'm always conscious if I'm talking too much and I tend to talk a lot. I think it's just um, just a personality trait, but it's also something that I have to recognize in terms of privilege, you know, who's not talking and how can I kind of shut up and, and amplify their voices instead of my own. Um, just because we're running out of time, we've got one more question and then I will open the floor to any panelist who wants to say anything, um, just in a way of kind of closing up. I'd love to hear all of your advice as well as just like a closing statement. But the last question that we have here is um, how important and or challenging do the panelists feel that it is to join and get involved in campaigning with political parties to, act, to achieve change? I mean, I would just say um, I mean, I, we know, I can't lie to you, there are serious problems in politics, there are serious problems in political parties. I wouldn't be as busy as I was if that wasn't the case. Um, but I think what I think needs to, you know, what, what we need is good people in politics. We need talented people in politics. We need, we need those people to kind of you know, to bring the parties forward and be better parties, which engage with people that have more diverse opinions, views, not that kind of group thing that Josephine was talking about. And um, there is there is a lack of that in a lot of um, in a lot of places in in politics. So, if you are a strong communicator and you are knowledgeable about your subject and you take the time to learn about your subject matter, you will be extremely valuable and you will give value the second that you come into that organization. And then I think the more, the problem is, is that, you know, you've got too many white old men in these kind of, in these spaces. And as soon as they, you know, they need to become outnumbered and they need to become the minority and then it will be safer spaces for other people but having said that you know in political um, parties there are specific groups that you can get involved with you know if you're a minority if you're a woman um, you can get involved in those and they can act as kind of safe spaces as well and if anyone messes with you in the Labour Party you can always come to me <laughs> um, and yeah I would just say find your support group find your people um, and you know it is a kind of, of ultimately enriching experience but you know politics is tough it's hard it's sometimes it's a battle um, and you need to be strong um, but with the right people around you you can do it 100% agree with that if anyone messes you if anyone messes with you in the Labour Party talk to me as well <laughs> and we'll get it sorted for you uh, I want to share something quickly um, last year was politically exhausting for me like emotionally mentally and politically exhausting seeing the deaths and the cases of covid the black lives matter protests the death of george floyd and brianna taylor um and all of that was just so exhausting so i decided i wanted to run 
for the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party. Because I'm like, the Labour Party is a vehicle of change. And if we get on it, then we can really like capitalize on the, like, the movements and, and the sentiment on the ground and like, win some elections. I didn't, first election that I ran was February um, of last year. I got the most amount, and this was for the BAME rep. I don't believe in the term BAME, but it was for the BAME rep and you represent all the ethnic minorities in the country and the Labour Party. Uh, and I got the most amount of membership votes, but I fell short because I didn't have the trade union support. And then I ran again later on in the year um, and I fell short just, just shy of the 10th. I came 10th and there was only nine seats available. And the reason why I'm sharing this is because uh, I realized that I actually wasted that year. I felt like I wasted that year, wasted that year trying to, to show the Labour Party that there needs to be grassroots voices on, at the echelons of the party. You need to be able to have that connection to the ground. The Labour Party on their National Executive Committee has never had a black man on that board in their entire existence. In 120 years, there's never been a black man elected onto that board. And I was shaking structures. But I started my year thinking that political parties was, were the vehicle of change. You can shake and move things with political parties. And yeah, maybe. And I ended last year saying that political parties are part of the problem too. Even the opposition parties are part of the problem. Sometimes they reflect the same inequalities that we are trying to fight. Sometimes they have their own sexism and racism. And we're trying to battle that. But there's something, and I'll refer back to what I said earlier, there's something about community organizing. The fight against apartheid in South Africa wasn't done just with the ANC party. That was led by student movements in Soweto. What we're seeing around the world is not just political parties. It's grassroots organizing. Biden's election, turning Georgia, that wasn't a political party. That was an individual and, and chapters of organizations coming together. So yeah, it's great that we can maybe turn to political parties, but they are sometimes part of the problem and they are sometimes part of the system that we're trying to rip apart. So I didn't mean to sound like an anarchist, but like they are part of the establishment to an extent. So I, I think that we need to look in our region, look to our neighbors, look in our local community, collaborate, join up with them to try and accelerate and maximize that social impact. Because you spend an all year to try and persuade a political party about the issues that affect you and your community is a waste of time. You do it, you do it. Oh, thank you so much. I feel like that's such a great way to end this um, fantastic call. Everyone has been so um, brilliant and I knew you guys would be. I'm so happy um, to hear everyone's um, comments and opinions and advice. And I think that this has been really inspiring and I hope everyone who's watching feels inspired to go out and make their voices heard. And, you know, just like what Jermaine was saying, sometimes you can work within the societal structures that are there and sometimes you need to break them, but whatever you do, do something, you know, and the first thing that you can do that's really, really easy is register to vote, you know, go out and vote. It's super easy, take you five minutes. It's completely free. Um, there's so many different ways to do it. You can do it online. Um, you can do it by um, writing it down. If you if you can't get a local printer, you can look cancel. Uh, you can contact your local counselor. There's lots of different ways. We have a lot of different information on our website that will teach you um, all the different ways that you can register to vote and all, all the different ways that you can vote as well, whether it's through proxy, through post or in person. There's so many different ways to get involved, but it'll take you five minutes and it's super easy and you can make your voice heard and you can make your impact in your local community. So that's the last thing I'll say. Um, and I just wanna say thank you again to our, all of our fantastic panelists. Their social medias are in the chat about everyone wants to follow along with all the fantastic work they're doing. Um, I want to say thank you again. Um, and thank you everybody for coming and listening along. Um, you guys have all been fantastic.